Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to Generational Conditioning for Negroes Part 2. And to you, our dear viewer, it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. This video is not a propaganda video and never a deliberate attempt to misinform anyone. The goal is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, teaching kids to count is fine, but teaching them what counts is best. Bob Talba And from our brother Otoba Kugano, Teaching would be exceedingly necessary to the pagan nations and ignorant people in every place and situation, but they do not need any unscriptural forms and ceremonies to be taught unto them. They can devise superstitions enough among themselves and church government too, if ever they need any. And here is a quick channel update that we shall be offline for some time Due to technical reasons, we have a broken device and until we're able to sort that out, we're just going to be offline for a while. Our regrets. Thank you. Generational conditioning. Have you ever wondered why the identifier of Negroes keeps changing? Have you ever wondered who changes them and why? Ever wondered if the so-called Negroes are informed before such changes are made? However, here is a comment of interest we got from a viewer in one of our videos and it says, The term Negro is considered obsolete and racist, so they likely reject that term and its Negroid derivative. And two, you will have a hard time convincing Igbo scholars that Aro did not use Ibinopabi to trick other Igbo into slavery. Now remember, the Negroes in general are conditioned to believe that they sold themselves or that Africans sold other Africans without telling them who in Africa sold the other. So this is why you see this user talking about Igbo scholars and the Aro and you know by a trick into slavery as if the slaves were acquired by just tricking somebody. If you notice, the slave master in Encyclopedia Britannica as well wrote that they recruited the slaves as against the raids and razzias through which they were obtained. So they made it look like slaves were just you come and tell somebody to become a slave and he becomes one which is part of the conditioning. But we're going to base today's topic on more around the Negro appellation being considered obsolete and racist. So the Negro appellation Looking at the Negro appellation, have you ever heard that it is offensive or obsolete or racist? Have you ever wondered when it became offensive? Ever wondered how it suddenly became offensive or racist? So let us take a look at some timelines by listening to someone like Martin Luther King Jr. and a portion of the I Have a Dream speech of the March on Washington. August 
in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, if by 1963 the Negro appellation was not offensive to the likes of Martin Luther King Jr., have you wondered how and when it became offensive then and who made it so? That's part of the conditioning. Remember, the Negro does not think for himself. He allows the slave master to do the thinking for him. If you check, you will discover that you either started seeing it as such based on perception, you were never told by anyone. You just assumed that thing because the Negro does not actually do his own thinking. The slave master understands this perfectly. Let us also listen to Malcolm X in 1963 as well. Today, in our discussion of minority groups, we have with us two guests. One is Minister Malcolm X. Shabazz one of the top leaders of the Nation of Islam, or the so-called Black Muslims. And we also have Mr. Herman Blake, uh, one of the teaching assistants in the course. Uh, we will discuss today some of the, the goals and some of the strategies of the Nation of Islam. And I wonder if Mr. Blake might start it off by asking um, Mr. Shabazz a question. Well, you maintain, for example, that, that you will not or that you should not use violence unless you are attacked by the white man. And I think we can note in the last several years, certainly, dozens and dozens and dozens of instances in which Negroes have been uh, attacked, uh, killed in some instances. You mean in these demonstrations? In these demonstrations and, and the bombings, for example, recently in Birmingham where they killed four little Negro girls. And what interests me is the fact is, is that the Nation of Islam has not done anything to retaliate. I think you should be happy. <laughs> uh, no, 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 the, no, 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 the important thing is, does your lack of action no, contradict any no, of your basic principles? Uh, I'll explain it. You should be happy. And the uh, uh, discriminators are against the law. Mm -hmm. But to show you the hypocrisy of the law, when Negroes demonstrate for integration, instead of uh, arresting the discriminators, the law arrests the demonstrators. So this is a foolish move on the part of Negroes. Here again, we saw that as at 1963, both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. used the Negro appellation, and that means it was still good at that time. So it becomes very clear to all of us that it hadn't become offensive as at 1963. Also, let us listen to Malcolm X in another speech about the house Negroes and the field Negroes. Back during slavery, when black people like me talked to the slaves, they didn't kill them. They sent some old house Negro along behind them to undo what he said. You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro 
and the field Negro. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. When the field Negroes got too much out of line, he held them back in check. He put them back on the plantation. The house Negro could afford to do that because he lived better than the field Negro. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic or the basement. He ate the same food his master ate and wore his same clothes. And he could talk just like his master. master. Good diction. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. That's why he didn't want his master hurt. If the master got sick, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. When the master's house caught a fire, he'd try and put the fire out. He didn't want his master's house burned. He never wanted his master's property threatened. And he was more defensive of it than the master was. That was the house Negro. But then you had some field Negro who lived in huts, had nothing to lose. They wore the worst kind of clothes, they ate the worst food, and they caught hell. They felt the sting of the lash. They hated their master. Oh, yes, they did. If the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. <laughs> if the master's house caught a fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. This was the difference between the two. And today, you still have house Negroes and field Negroes. I'm a field Negro. So now that we have seen that Negro was not offensive in the 60s, let us see if we can understand how it became offensive or if it was just part of the ability of the slave master to condition the Negro the way he wants. Remember, this will also help us understand where they are going with the Dan Calloway new fraud of how Indians are Negroes and all that. So it will help us because when you look at these historical facts and understand where the truth lies, it becomes difficult for anyone to bamboozle you with any rubbish, no matter how persuasive they are. So let us reference what's in a name, Negro versus Afro-American versus Black, etc. A review of general semantics by Bennett L. et al and it was published 1969 please bear in mind that because we are looking at something contemporary we are not sticking to the concept of anything before 1950 because this is not purely about the slave trade from 1950 downwards was when they started changing the narrative of the slave trade they never denied being the ones that captured and sold the negroes until then and is also part of the conditioning so they started telling the next generation a lie on time so you might have seen this then callaway madness of how negroes are indians or aborigine or niji or whatever thing they concocted it's the same thing you notice he has music he has merchandise and all that that's part of the thing it will start going like that the next generation and people born today will grow up believing that's what they are that's the slave master's technique it doesn't change he's not super smart the only difference is that he knows where to harness the human capital of the fool from that's all he knows he knows where the fools live in africa too so if he wants to come and steal the resources from africa he knows where the fool lives if he wants to change the negro population he also knows where the fool lives that's his only game that's his strength too. So this academic journal starts off by saying, more concretely, within the context of the racial looking glass, the question is whether one can make the word Negro mean so many different things or whether one should abandon it and use the words Black or Afro-American. Remember this was by 1969. So it goes further to say, this question is at the root of a bitter national controversy over the proper designation for identifiable Americans of African descent. More than 40 million white Americans, according to some scholars, have African ancestors. A large and vocal group is pressing an aggressive campaign for the use of the word Afro-American as the only historically accurate and humanly significant designation of this large and pivotal portion of the American population. This group charges that the word Negro 
is an inaccurate epithet which perpetuates the master-slave mentality in the minds of both black and white Americans. An equally large but not so vocal group says the word Negro is as accurate and as euphonious as the words black and Afro-American. So they are saying they are all about the same things. This group is scornful of the premises of the advocates of change. Note this very well and go and follow the responses to the new one being propagated by Dan Calloway. You will understand what this journal is saying. A Negro by any other name they say would be as black and as beautiful and as segregated. The times they add are too crucial for Negroes to dissipate their energy in fratricidal strife over names. But the pro-black contingent contends with Humpty Dumpty that names are of the essence of the game of power and control, and they maintain that a change in name will short-circuit the stereotyped thinking patterns that undergird the system of racism in America. To make things even more complicated, a third group composed primarily of black power advocates has adopted a new vocabulary in which the word black is reserved for black brothers and sisters who are emancipating themselves and the word negro is used contemptuously for negroes who are still in whitey's bag and who still think of themselves and speak of themselves as negroes so we want you to compare this controversy we are talking about or reading about here with this controversy of the latest one they are coming with which is aborigine all the nonsense they are concocting which they are propagating through then if you can study this journal very well you will be able to relate it to what they are trying to do with the Nkalawe narrative you will understand it very well it won't take you anything to know what the scenario was at that time and what it is like today and here it goes further to say some pro-negro advocates charged indignantly that the whole black issue was raised by a handful of intellectuals none of whom are black except for their beards but it was obvious that the controversy touched deep emotions in the black community where many segments particularly the young are engaged in an agonizing search for self-identity and self-determination so you see why self-determination is a, also a problem in places like Biafra and Ambazonia in Nigeria and Cameroon so you see what the slave master simply does is uh, he looks for one lucky gives him what he wants him to propagate and they start burning there will be that disagreement neither here nor there those will say oh let's go with it others will say no we can't now notice that since you were born since the beginning of time perhaps since whenever you can think about the scotland or scottish have been scottish the english have been english whatever they are the portuguese have been portuguese they started the slave trade they are still portuguese till today but now the negro appellation has changed from sudanese ethiopians guineas grometas negroes blacks and African Americans and of course it's now going or gravitating towards Aborigine or Niji whatever they are using the Nkala way to propagate now so you understand what we're talking about now the question still remains how did the appellation become offensive and obsolete when it was just used in 1963 whereas things like the religions they brought in 18 somethings 17 somethings are not considered obsolete yet but the identity, the appellation has already been marked as obsolete and racist. So you see how the game of the slave master works. And here going further, you see the changes that were made. And it says the Negro Teachers Association of New York City, for example, became the African American Teachers Association. So you see how they started it. Now remember, this is 1969. This is different from when Jesse Jackson came to say they now prefer to be known as that in 1988. So when you listen to Dan Calloway, it's incumbent on you to conduct your own research. Stop listening to anybody, including us. 
conduct your own research at least if you follow the comments on this channel follow the comments on Dane's channel follow the comments on other channels you should be able to figure out what is going on very easily so if you conduct your own research you will very easily see that they are just working to change the appellation and the reason they do it is it helps them disconnect the next generation from the previous generation remember how we mentioned to you about the yoruba question now the average negro that was born in what you call yoruba land today you hear some of them say oh yorubas were also sold whereas there was nothing like yoruba during the slave trade so that's how difficult it is when you follow the slave master and his narratives you have to conduct your own research you have to give yourself benefit of hindsight and look at history very well and connect the dots so it goes further to tell us that the amsterdam news one of the largest black newspapers announced that it would no longer use the word negro the newspaper which now identifies americans of african descent as afro-americans reports a favorable response to the change dick edwards the assistant managing editor says letters are running nine to one in favor of afro-american note this it was afro-american at that time this is 1969 journal so that you understand what we're saying we like the word he says we use it because we are descendants of africans and because we are americans he added there is a cringing from the word negro especially by the young because of the oppression into which we were born and because that name was imposed on us there seems to be a violent objection to the term among young people who link the word negro with uncle tom they seldom use the word negro they use black and african some of them even object to the word african-american preferring the term afram is the name game real will it last so again you see that but today there is a day in callaway telling everybody that they are no longer from africa so you see how smart the slave master is now if you look at the guy and you think he is doing anything for the so-called african americans then you have not looked at the facts ask yourself the slave master never pays the slave anywhere never he will pay anyone that is on top but not the slaves never if you check when they were freed only the slave owners were paid the slaves were never paid if you were to go to a place like Nigeria today, go to Biafra, go to Ambazonia, you will see that the slave master is always on the side of those that they consider non-Negroes. That's the truth of the matter. So if they wanted to free the so-called African Americans, there is no way whoever wants to do that can start by changing their identity and their appellation. It doesn't make sense. So if he's coming to tell you you are aboriginal, you are this, what is the point? What is he trying to achieve? So this is very critical, but let's just move forward. So it goes further to say, to answer these questions and to relate them to the whole bubbling controversy, one must go back 400 years. For Americans of African descent have been arguing about names ever since they were forcibly transported from Africa by Europeans who arbitrarily branded them black, blacker moors, moors, niggers, and negroes. The English word Negro is a derivative of the Spanish and Portuguese word Negro, which means black. The Portuguese and Spanish, who were pioneers in the African slave trade, used this adjective to designate the African men and women whom they captured and transported to the slave mart of the New World. Within a short time, the Portuguese word Negro, no capital, became the English noun adjective Negro. This word, which was not capitalized at first, fused not only humanity, nationality, and place of origin, but also certain white judgments about the inherent and irredeemable inferiority of the persons so designated. The word also referred to certain Jim Crow places, i.e. the Negro pew in Christian churches. The reaction of their first Americans of African descent to the word Negro has never been adequately studied, 
but it appears from an examination of surviving documents that literate black people resisted the world with cunning and tenacity. The first black immigrants seem to have preferred the word African. In surviving documents, they referred to themselves as blacks, blackies, and Africans. And the first institutions organized by Americans of African descent were designated African, visibly the Free African Society, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the African Baptist Church, the preamble of the Free African Society, which we founded which was founded in philadelphia in 1787 began we the free africans and their descendants of the city of philadelphia in the state of pennsylvania or elsewhere so but our interest is for you to see how this same thing these same people that are being talked about here are suddenly now becoming aboriginal just thanks to only one man so you see how the conditioning works the slave master understands this perfectly so the only way out of it is for people to understand the same thing the slave master knows about them so when these lies come up they know how to avoid them so that's why you notice that they are using somebody who looks more like a so-called african-american to propagate it if you go and check then Calloway's history you will see that he has no academic pedigree to be peddling that lie but then there are some people hiding behind him and helping him do it. That's why you see he has music, appears multi-talented in all these things. But ask yourself, if somebody knows how to do music, how to make merchandise of other things, why do things that are detrimental to his uh, so-called siblings? Now remember, the same person telling you that his people were never slaves is the same person telling you he is working to free these people. How can you free a people that have never been slaves? He also claims that white people were also enslaved. So you notice the same thing you hear Yorubas say, albeit ignorantly, that Yorubas were also sold. You hear Fulani say the same thing. You hear the Ashanti say the same thing. Their alibi follows only one pattern, that they were also sold. So you see then Calloway coming to tell you that slave trade didn't happen, that it was now employment. So right there you will see that the slave master is hiding behind him. They want to change it. So the next generation as children now will start hearing that the slave trade didn't even happen. From that they grow up and that's how it disappears. So you will be surprised to hear that if your ancestors were brought up today, they will never believe that the world today thinks that it was Africans selling other Africans. They will never believe that somehow you believe that your brother or your sister that is in ancestral terms could have sold the sister of brother after all the negroes are not a mam cow or cattle that you just say sit here and they sit stand here and they stand you need military force to do that that's why you see the armies in sub-saharan africa and that's why you see the the foot soldiers they will always be the first to shout we are all africans why not ask yourself if we were all africans in a place places like europe you might think the armies in europe and america are the same as the armies in sub-saharan africa now tell us how you believe that the nigerian army is protecting you from the Ghanaian army protecting you from the same people you say we are all africans protecting you from them coming to take your land but you are all the same so you see the slave master is very subtle and which we shall ultimately show you in one of our series when we come back after being offline for a while so you understand what we're talking about so here it says we are told for example that Blanche Kelso Bruce the first black man to serve a full term in the US Senate refused to use the word colored saying I am a Negro and proud of my race Bruce's example was not followed by all Reconstruction leaders. In the North Carolina Constitutional Convention of 1868, James Walker Hood, one of the 15 black delegates, denied that there was a Negro on the floor of the convention. Outraged and insulted, he insisted that the word Negro had no significance as to law, but could only be used in a reproachful or degrading sense and he further declared that no man on that floor knew where the term originated. 
since it was not found in ancient history, inspired or profane. So you see what we're telling you? You see why they are changing the appellations? So you can't find the name beyond a certain period. So that's why if we give you this challenge to find out the oldest Negro recorded in human history, it won't go beyond the 17 somethings. But the so-called Negroes existed before then. But if they can be changing the appellation, the Negro can only be a few hundred years old. And they continue their iterative slavery method, which we can show you, we demonstrate it, we illustrate it with beautiful diagrams that you will understand. That's after this period that we're going to be offline for a while. So you understand what we're talking about. So you see, you can read this whole thing down yourself. But the important thing is for you to understand that something like then Callaway is part of the generational conditioning. You see how from nowhere somebody wakes up and starts propagating pure lies. You understand is a lie. Many understand is a lie. But what they do not know is why he's doing it or who is behind him. They think he's just one guy looking for YouTube money. If you notice, he starts with how he wants to be supported. Now, if you look at it on the surface, he will say, that's what they did here. That's what they did there. That's what they did. You think he is actually talking and working for the so-called negroes but he's actually working for the slave master which we can demonstrate and show you in very clear terms based on recorded history at least you can read these journals yourself we didn't write them this is 1969 we were not even born by then so and most of the people watching this channel may not have been born by then so you understand what we're talking about so it goes further to tell us that in periods of reaction and extreme stress, black people usually turn inward. They begin to redefine themselves and they begin to argue seriously about names. So you see the thing, you see how the moment these issues started coming up of recent and all that, then you start seeing aborigine and start seeing all kinds of nonsense. The question should be, if Aborigine is not your language. How can it be your name? How can it be something you identify yourself with? If he says it's Niji, what does Niji mean? So it's incumbent on you to make sure that that is debunked. Otherwise, this is how it's going to be back and forth. Then the Indians will hide underneath and be propagating it because they understand the game and the slave master understands the game as well. There is that conspiracy against the Negroes. It's the same thing happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. We want you to sit back and ask yourself, why does CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera all turn a blind eye when Nigerian government massacres Biafrans or when Cameroonian government massacres Ambazonians? Those are questions you have to ask. And remember, those people are Negroes. The powers and authorities in those countries are not. So when you talk, you will see the slave master's propaganda channel will be defending those states but they turn the other way when killings are done if you doubt us just investigate what is happening in places of like the middle belt of nigeria you will understand what we're saying you don't need to believe us you just need to research it yourself that's all you need to do read the historical records and you will understand it it's not rocket science the slave master understands that the negro does not look back and forward he only dwells where he is that's the problem so please find time to look for these materials and study them yourself that's all you need to do then after reading it at least it will give you a foundation and then you understand what the Callaway is doing you will understand that the slave master is obviously working and sponsoring him again you see that the word colored still retained a commanding position in this period but men like frederick douglas and booker t washington used the word negro freely so you see malcolm x used it martin luther king jr used it booker t washington used it frederick douglas used it so now ask yourself how did it change how did it become racist because the slave master uses his foot soldiers if you notice the viewer that made this comment is the same viewer that has been defending the fulanese he's the same one that has been defending the nigerian army Ordinarily, if you're a victim of something, no matter how it happens, if someone told you that this is the person responsible for that your problem, 
you're you are bound to look at it logically you're bound to look at it differently but if you notice those hermetic groups no matter what you say they are always in defense of the slave master they defend the slave master and then try to turn against their siblings why not just sit back and ask yourself why are they never interested in finding out who sold who and how it was done they are more interested in saying oh this person was also sold yes okay whoever was sold let us find out how it was done they never talk about it ask yourself why so if you notice all they do is to help the slave master propagate his lies so when the negro is conquered and conditioned like we're talking about you will see that he becomes more catholic than the pope he starts working for the slave master against his own siblings if you want to understand it very well go to places like nigeria cameroon look at ambazonia look at biafra so you see that the same group that they have used since the slave trade is still the same group they use today ask yourself why you will have a sibling whatever the issue is let's say you are human you are not cattle and that your sibling comes to say i have this problem and your response is to take a gun and start killing him and his children you need to just sit back and ask yourself why those things are happening and the slave master turns the other way meanwhile he provides them with the weapons and that right there should give them away if you were to reason very well but unfortunately because some negroes especially the so-called african americans and the negroes in europe are conditioned to believe that africans are the same they forget to ask who is giving them these guns you say africa is poor we agree so how come something that is more expensive than food is getting to them in a way that you need to ask questions about but let's just move forward at least you see what it tells us here about the negroes and the appellation and it goes further to talk about there were also articulate exponents of the afro-american team as evidenced by the founding in 1899 of the national afro-american league and the baltimore afro-american newspaper established in 1892 toward the end of the century the word negro began to supplant the word scholar and afro-american you see so you see how it uh, supplanted afro-american and colored it was during this period that the first national negro organization the american negro academy in 1897 and the national negro business league in 1900 were founded the founding of the national association for the advancement of colored people in 1909 marked it seems the disappearing peak of the colored movement by 1919 the negro yearbook could report there is an increasing use of the word negro and a decreasing use of the words colored and afro-american to designate us as a people the result is that the word negro is more and more acquiring a dignity that he did not have in the past during this same period there was an aggressive campaign for capitalization of the word negro this campaign which was led by NWACP peaked in 1930 when the New York Times announced that it would print the word Negro with a capital letter. Now we ask you, remember when we told you that the slave master will leverage on whatever he prefers to change the appellation? We told you that the Indian appellation or the Denkaloway Niji or whatever crap he concocted with the slave master, the slave master will wake up one day when the time becomes right to say he now prefers because the people prefer it that's how he does that's his game if you can study history you see that that's all his games but let's just finish up and you see what it says that although the word negro became a generally acceptable designation in the 1930s there was strong opposition from militant radicals like adam clayton powell who continued to use the word black and from militant nationalists like Elijah Muhammad, who continued to speak of so-called Negroes, this opposition, inchoate and unorganized, was sharpened in the 50s and 60s by the rhetorical artistry of Malcolm X and the emergence of the Black Power Movement. But Malcolm X and the Black Power Movement 
we are reflections of a general crisis of identity which is similar in tone and urgency to the crisis of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th. It appears, note this sentence very well, he says it appears, he didn't say it must be or it is, so he just says it appears. So that's, you have to just read between the lines. From this short historical sketch that the word Negro has been a general acceptable term in the black or, if you prefer, the Negro community for a relatively short time. But this is not true because we notice that if you read books from the 17 somethings, it referred to them as grometers and then as Negroes as well, a little bit later. So it's longer than this author is making us to understand. Now remember, because the Negro doesn't look back in time a lot, the slave master understands how to do iterative narrative in such a way that he can start the story from, let's say, five years behind. And then start conditioning the next generation with that appellation which is what he's doing with the indian or aborigine or whatever appellation he has brought newly with this group so unfortunately you can see that the problem has always been there he knows how to make the negro speak from different angles confuse their tongues and put them in a state of chaos and that's his game so you can at least see what is happening here so he goes further to tell us that um, contemporary critics of the word Negro say Booker T. Washington was primarily responsible for the campaign in which Negro supplanted the words Black, Colored, and Afro-American. There is truth in this. The Negro Yearbook and the Negro Business League were Washington projects, but it is not the whole truth. The movement for adoption of the word Negro was also given a strong impetus by militant ra radicals like W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the founders of the American Negro Academy, and militant nationalists like Marcus Garvey, who used the word Negro consistently and named his organization the Universal Negro Improvement Association. But our interest is for you to see how this whole thing has been happening from then till today so you see how one madman from nowhere just jumped up to say it's no longer any of these it's not even black totally everything now the reason they changed this appellation by this important point in mind is so that the negro will never have a history remember they believe the negro was created to be a slave forever so that's why they are changing it no other thing but the negro doesn't understand this that's why they can't remain with one somebody wakes up because the slave master will sponsor them anyways to say oh no this one is not it we have to go with this and others will not agree but unfortunately whoever the slave master has somehow elevated to the role of a house negro then he starts using him against his siblings who are supposedly the failed negroes that's the technique that's the game and here is a letter you can read about a student who had issues with the ne term Negro and the response he got was that do not at the outset of your career make the all too common error of mistaking names for things. Names are only conventional signs for identifying things. Things are the reality that counts. If a thing is despised, either because of ignorance or because it is despicable you will not alter matters by changing its name. If men despise Negroes, they will not despise them less if Negroes are called colored or Afro-Americans. So you can pause this video and read the entire thing yourself. But it goes further to say, moreover, you cannot change the name of a thing at will. Names are not merely matters of thought and reason. They are growths and habits. As long as the majority of men mean black or brown folk when they say negro so long will negro be the name of folks brown and black and neither anger nor welling nor tears can or will change the name until the name habit changes so again you see that this student is a child going through the conditioning process so you see how they conditioned him to see the negro as offensive name that's exactly what 
that Dane Calloway and the Niji Aborigine or Indian narrative is doing right now. So if you go to the channel and read the comments, you will see some people that will say, we have started teaching it in our schools. Now those people are ignorantly helping the slave master condition the next generation, unbeknownst to them anyways. So that's how the slave master's conditioning works. So it goes through generations. So those people will grow up and when you mention that you are African-American or Negro, the way you see Negro today, that's how they will be seen African-American or Black. If you notice, then Calloway also fights the Black appellation. He will say, oh, this shirt is Black. It's not my color. If you notice, it's only the so-called Negroes that are quarreling with that any identity, any appellation all the time. Because that's the slave master's way of keeping them slaves or as slaves forever let us also reference from negro to black to african-american the power of names and naming political science quarterly volume 106 and it was by martin b and it was published 1991 and there we see the following that in a december 1988 news conference at chicago's hyatt regency O'Hare hotel where leaders of 75 black groups met to discuss a new national black agenda. Jesse Jackson announced that members of their race preferred to be called African Americans. The campaign he then led to replace the term black met immediate success among African American opinion makers and more gradual acceptance in the national press. Jackson's cultural offensive proposed an ethnic reference for a racial one, aiming thereby to help create as much as express a sense of ethnic identity among black Americans. It recalled the successful imposition of black over Negro 20 years earlier and renewed other themes of black power movement of the late 1960s. So it goes further to say, to be called African Americans has cultural integrity, Jackson said. It puts us in our proper historical context. Every ethnic group in this country has a reference to some land base, some historical cultural base. African Americans have hit that level of cultural maturity. There are Armenian Americans and Jewish Americans and Arab Americans and Italian Americans and with a degree of accepted and reasonable pride, they connect their heritage to their mother country and where they are now. So you see how that name you are talking about today came to be and you see how it metamorphosed from history. So it's incumbent on you to now find out why the Denkalawe narrative just sprang up. That's the same game they are playing. It doesn't change. And the negro never learns and that's where the problem lies so imagine if when things like biafra and ambazonia are raging in sub-saharan africa the slave masters media channels refuse to carry them the negroes do not join and take sides with the hermetic groups who are the slave master food soldiers to now join the boycott that should have been the time the negro will be propagating those things himself so that the slave master will at least know that his secrets are known just that the people are not together at least but instead you will see them preaching unity what does unity mean in a place where somebody is killing you creating orphans creating widows creating widowers every day with weapons provided by the same group they raided the slaves with and then you are talking of unity with such people our question to you is is it unity from the grave or unity from the living we don't understand it so you will see some so-called African Americans preaching, oh, you stay together in Nigeria, you stay together in Cameroon, without asking themselves, why will somebody who claims to be your brother be killing you in hundreds, and the slave master who claims to be impartial will pretend not to see, and yet the so-called African Americans, the Negroes, will refuse to see that there must be something not right with the way the people are handling issues in that region, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in what was Negro land and Guinea. So you understand what conditioning does. 
they have been conditioned to believe that being in one geographical space is called unity. That's why when they kill them, they still live with the thing without knowing that it is the enemy within technique that the slave master is using against the Negroes in that instance. So in this journal, it talks about researching African roots. Now remember, most of the researches conducted by the slave masters are controlled. They choose what the outcome has to be. So you see where it says the campaign for renewal of an African heritage record earlier searches among black intellectuals for African cultural achievements and survivals in the black diaspora as well as disputes in the late 1960s over the meaning of blackness. Sub-Saharan Africa, like Northwestern Europe for long periods, was isolated physically from the core areas in which the great early civilizations developing mythology, writing, agriculture and cities maintained indirect contact with each other in an arc from Spain and Morocco to China since there is no evidence of an indigenous written languages among the hundreds of different societies appearing and disappearing over centuries across the vast heterogeneous area south of the Sahara. South of the Sahara is where you have Nigeria then today, where you have places like uh, Biafra and Ambazonia. That's south of the Sahara down there. If you look at your map, you will understand what we're talking about. So you see that this whole thing is an age-long thing. But it goes further to tell us that French-speaking black intellectuals in the 1940s launched a search for negritude to refute the idea that Africa had made no great contributions towards civilization. At one extreme, to show the African is inherently gifted technically, writers held that black Africans first invented most of the achievements of civilization from mathematics, arts and science to writing, engineering and architecture. But those are not our interests. Our interest is for you to see how the conditioning is done and how they use the same Negroes to condition the next generation. So we will continue to show you some of this when we return back from a brief period of um, sorting out some technical issues with some of our devices. But then, before we round up, let's show you one little thing. Notice where they said the people had no way of writing which is not very correct. So let us reference some notes on Ansebede by J. McGregor and it was published 1909 on the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, page 39. And we see where it tells us that Ansebede is the native name for a writing used a little here in the Calabar district of the eastern province of southern Nigeria but much more largely up the cross river and inland from it on both banks. Then he goes further to say that the existence of a script is unknown to Europeans must not however be taken as conclusive evidence that the script does not exist for the native have a strange but natural desire to hide as much as they can from the prying eyes of the European who has too often but learned what they held precious only to scoff at them. And of course here we come to the end of this edition of Generational Conditioning for Dingles Part 2. We thank you very much for listening and we do hope and challenge you to find time to conduct your own research. Peace.